Welcome to Hot Chips 18. Session 7. Novel Silicon Applications. Uh, the title here is uh, Novel Silicon Applications. Uh, my name is Raja Mirtharaja. I'm a professor at UC Davis. Um, and in this session, we're going to be looking at um, a lot of more forward-looking uh, technologies, um, things that are still in the research phase and either in academia or uh, in industry. Um, and our first talk uh, is going to be given by uh, Professor Rob Rutenbar. Um, he is the Jetras Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he received his PhD uh, from the University of Michigan in computer engineering. Um, his research interests are in high performance digital integrated circuits and computer aided design. And today he'll be talking about speech recognition um, in silicon. So, okay, thanks very much. So, thank you all for listening to the gong and coming back. I'm. Uh, I'm uh, mindful of the fact that uh, you know being the first guy up after lunch means that I'm I'm, I'm competing with your crashing insulin levels for mind share, so I'll see what I can do to try to make this interesting. So I want to talk about this project called In Silico Vox that's uh, that's been happening at Carnegie Mellon for a while, which is speech recognition in silicon. So you know where are we with speech recognition in, just in general? Well, um, on the on the desktop, on a you know a high end you know enterprise class kind of call center, on a you know on a big computer with a lot of memory, how are we doing? Quality is okay. I, I can't honestly say it's great yet. Vocabulary is very large. 50,000 words is, is very doable. Um, none of those things are true as we sort of you know, reduce the form factor. And you know, even if you can run uh, some, some speech recognition on your cell phone, the, the, the quality is not really great and the vocabulary is really small. One thing that is true about all of these things, whether it's an enterprise class sort of uh, you know, call-in center or just some you know, little, little um, you know, handheld kind of electronic app, is that all of these things are, are, are software applications. So let's just sort of step back for a bit and, and ask the question, how hard is it to do this, this kind of application today in, in, in software? And I, I mean, I think I'm not saying anything surprising to anybody if I say best quality recognition, which is sort of you know, the, the, the best you can do on a really big vocabulary, is really very hard, especially for the, to the, the interesting case, speaker independent, large vocabulary, continuous connected speech, like I'm, like I'm doing at you right now. Um, as a very rough set of guideposts for sort of how difficult this is, let me, let me offer you this uh, 110, 100, 1,000 rule in big round numbers. If you're interested in, in recognizing it real time, okay, if you're looking for an error rate not more than 10%, which is not great, but that's, that's actually pretty good, um, you need something in the neighborhood of 100 megabytes of, uh, of memory footprint. You need something in the neighborhood of 100 watts. You, know, you need a real processor to do this, and you need something in the neighborhood of a gigahertz of CPU to pull this sort of thing off. And you know, this is very doable um, on the desktop, but it turns out that this is remarkably limiting. Okay, so the In Silico Vox project at CMU, which has been happening, happening for a while, although this is actually the first sort of you know, public outing of this stuff, um, has this as its thesis, right? And it's that it's time to liberate speech recognition from the unreasonable limitations of software, that it's just a bad idea to continue trying to push this technology forward in a software-only form. And we think that the obvious answer is to do this in silicon. And there's a couple of reasons. The first is that most of the compelling apps tomorrow don't want 20% or 30%. They want factors of 100 or factors of 1,000 in performance or power. And we just think that ain't going to happen in a software-only form. And the other interesting reason for this is that we have some really successful historical examples of this migration. And the, the most obvious is graphics. Nobody paints pixels in, in, in software. You'd be nuts to, you know, to think about trying to run an Xbox 360 as just all software, you know, pushing your pixels around. It's vastly too limiting for performance, and it's way too inefficient for power. And it's certainly true on the desktop that there's some high-end graphics chip, but it's also true even in the portable space right now. Those videos that you're sort of streaming from, you know, from ESPN or whatever, those things are not being painted, you know, on your screen by software. There's actually a small graphics engine doing that. So we have a very good historical precedent for why we ought to do this. We also have some compelling applications, and there's lots and lots of them, and I'm, I'm just going to talk about two here. 
The one on the left is audio mining, which is a sort of the new buzzword, which is very fast recognizer. So these aren't recognizers that aren't running at real time. These are recognizers that are running at 10x real time or 100x real time or 1,000x real time, like a recognizer running in your DVD that lets you fast forward this particular local personality, I'm told, okay? Fast forward into the point where he says, hasta la vista, baby. You know, my DVD can go sort of 20x, 50x, 100x real time forward. I would like to be able to search that stream. If you look at some of the evolving video mining kinds of technologies that are available on the web, where you go in a video where a particular catchphrase or a particular tagline or something is stated, the way that's actually being done is text search on closed captioning versions of that. It's absolutely not happening live. So there's lots and lots of applications in audio mining. There's also just all the hands-free appliances applications, you know, very portable recognizers. And the problem there is you don't have 100 watts. You don't even have a watt. In a cell phone environment, you have a hard three watt limit. If you're looking at putting a significant sort of feature add on something, you have 100 milliwatts, maybe 300 milliwatts to do this. I mean, I, I, that's, that's, you know, many, many orders of magnitude beyond where software is going to get me. And, you know, the obvious application for there is the ability to actually do something like decent dictation in a cell phone, which is still, you know, we're still pretty far away from that. What I'm going to talk about today is just the left-hand side. I'm just going to talk about the goal of trying to do very high quality, sort of best quality recognition very, very fast. Right? And we're just sort of getting to the point where we, you know, we have some results to show, which is why I'm here today. So this is the overall structure of this talk. Um, the first is the, the $2 tour, how speech recognition works. I figure, you know, based on, on, you know, yesterday, everybody at this point knows how sort of streaming video and H.26 whatever and stuff works. Right? Um, but I don't really have to assume that you actually know how speech recognition works. And in you know, 30 minutes, I ain't going to explain it to you, but I'm going to give you sort of the high points. Then I'm going to talk about an ASIC architecture to do this that talks about how you strip away all the CPU-centric stuff and sort of get right down to what you need to do this application well. And then I'm going to show you two sorts of results. I'm going to show you some simulated results from, from, an, from an ASIC design, but something maybe more interesting for, for you guys, I'm going to show you an FPGA version. I'm actually going to show you a video of a live version of this thing running. So how does speech recognition work? Very complicated diagram with three big sections that I'm going to talk about. There's something called the acoustic front end that goes from somebody talking into a microphone and an A to D converter to a big vector full of numbers. There's something called the scoring stage that goes from a vector full of numbers to a vector full of probabilities. Right? And there's something called back end search, which actually sort of glues all the things you think you heard together to try to recognize something, hopefully what you actually said. Right? The acoustic front end is basically signal processing. Okay? You talk into a microphone, it goes through ADC, and it goes through a whole bunch of transformations. We, sort of, we take spectra of it, we combine the spectral components in interesting ways, we take logarithms of them and we glue them together in ways motivated by the, sort of, by the interesting physiology of the human ear. We take that information, we take first and second time derivatives of it so we can talk, say whether we're, sort of, we're going up in pitch or down in pitch and what's happening over time. We glue all that stuff together and what we get is, at the end of it, we get a feature or a feature vector. We get a point in a high dimensional space that says, in this little tiny sliver of time, 10, nano, 10 milliseconds, I think I heard this. Okay? The scoring stage takes that feature vector, which for all the examples we're going to show you is a 39 dimensional vector. Okay? That vector of, I think I heard this, and it matches it against a finite library of stuff you know. Okay? And what that stuff you know is, is a library of atomic sounds of things that you can match against. Right? Now, the problem is, how do you actually represent a, a library of atomic sounds in 39 dimensions? Well, it turns out that there's a bunch of ways, but the way we're using them, sort of the most standard way, is something called the Gaussian mixture model. And a Gaussian mixture is a big bag full of high dimensional Gaussian densities that's supposed to approximate the probability, okay, if you add them all up, Okay, that this particular thing that you heard matches that. And what's challenging here is this is some horrible, you know, giant glob in 39 dimensional space because, you know, one side of this is the way boys sound, one side of this is the way girls sound, one side of this is the way my flat Midwestern accent sounds, one side of this is the way your non flat, non Midwestern accent sounds. So this is kind of challenging. And in particular, if you have lots of sounds, and we do, and lots of dimensions, and we do, and lots of Gaussians, and we do, this this is big. This is a big data set. This is tens of megabytes of stuff. Right? Now, the back end search is made challenging by the fact that speech is not a flat thing. Okay? It's a complicated layered thing. So if we take sort of a typical set of speech layers, up at the top there's a language model, which are the words and the orders in which words are allowed to happen, or at least have probabilities to happen. 
There's then a word level model where the words get taken apart into pieces like no gets taken apart into acoustic units like the N sound and the O sound. Unfortunately, that's still too granular. Those things actually get taken apart into the subacoustic units, which were the things that I just showed you, the features, you know, like a bunch of little tiny sounds which when strung together make the N sound. And it's the sort of the cross product of this thing which is being searched from the bottom to the top concurrently, which makes speech recognition challenging. So if, you're, if you have any DSP background and you know what a hidden Markov model or Viterbi is, that's what's happening down at the bottom of this stuff. That's not exactly what's happening at the top of this stuff. It gets sort of idiosyncratic as you go to the top of the food chain here. So, you know, what's an idiosyncrasy? Well, gosh, there's lots of them in this business. Let me give you one. Okay, English has about 50 atomic sounds. They're called phones, right? So this is the N sound in no and the O sound in, o, in, o, in no. Um, unfortunately, we don't get to recognize 50 things. We actually have to recognize 50 times 50 times 50, which is north of 120,000, okay? Try phones. And the reason for that is that if I say five and I say nine, there's an I in the middle of those things. Unfortunately, the I sound in the middle of five is modulated by the fact that my lips were just stopping the F sound and are about to go to the V sound. And the I sound in nine is modulated by the fact that I was just saying an N and I'm about to say an N again. And it sounds different at this sort of 10 millisecond kind of granularity. And if you don't track that kind of stuff and map to that kind of stuff, you don't get any good recognition. It doesn't work at all. There is a similar kind of contextual deal going on at the top of the food chain here. These are what are called language models, and the, the language model that we're using, the most standard language models around are called n-gram models. We're actually using a trigram model. Again, that's the most standard. And what this is, is this says, look, every word you have has a probability based on the training data that you had to train this recognizer. That helps you, you know, know that certain words are more likely than other. But there are also word pairs that have certain higher probabilities, and we will track some of those. And there are also word triples that have some probability, and we will track those. And those, those extra sort of probabilistic um, bits of data help you recognize that this thing that maybe you mumbled or, you know, there was some noise in the background, that's, that's actually probably what you said because the language model tells you that there's some enhanced probability that that was what you said as opposed to something else. You put all this stuff together and the sort of the one bottom line here is like this is why these things are computationally challenging, but this is also why these things are computationally enormous, okay? Um, good speech models are, are gigantically big, right? So, um, you have, you know, from the feature vector, you may have sort of 5,000 atomic scores. Those are the sort of the little tiny units of atomic speech that we can, that we can track and score. You have, in this case, 111,000 triples, those, those, those triphones. That, that then gets um, hammered on by 64,000 unigrams. This is a 64,000 word vocabulary. This particular, particular um, benchmark is the broadcast news benchmark. So this is hundreds of hours of CNN and stuff like that from the television. Um, 64,000 single word probabilities, 9 million or so bigram two word probabilities, 13 million three word, three word probabilities. This is why this is a non-trivial footprint. This is why these things aren't small. This is why these things, this is in part why these things are computationally challenging because you're constantly sort of hammering up and down the layers of, these, of, of this recognition hierarchy, gathering all the data you need to know that you're doing a good job. Okay, so. Suppose that we want to take this app and we want to put it in silicon. What would you do? Well, the first thing you'd do is you'd go buy a lot of pizza and a lot of beer for people who make the software version, okay? And that's more or less what we've done for the last five years, okay? Right, it was an excellent investment, let me tell you, okay? So, this is a particular recognizer. This is a state-of-the-art recognizer. This is Sphinx 3.0 from, from the Carnegie Mellon folks. Um, there have been some prior studies, if you're into, into this literature. This is the first one for the sort of the more modern version of this recognizer. We use Simple Scalar and Intel VTune. And we said, where does it spend its time? And what's interesting is that it doesn't spend any time. I mean, literally, you know, fractional percent of a time in the acoustic front end, even though it's doing all this complicated stuff. And the reason is that um, the front end is audio rate. Right. I mean, this stuff is, is, you know, coming in and, you know, tens of kilohertz. I mean, it's just not hard. It's challenging. It's a lot of gates. It's complicated, but it's not, you know, it's not a whole lot of work. Where all of the work is, is doing those zillions of scoring calculations for every atomic sound that you can map to, and doing all of those layers up the language model from the acoustics to the words to the language, hammering on these giant memory footprints for the graph search problems that glue this stuff together. So the first piece of the puzzle here is, you know, the front end, it's DSP, it's, it's not gonna kill you. There's a lot of ways to do that in silicon. It's all the back end. Okay, memory, what's up, what's up with memory? Okay, so this is um, some memory studies. So this is Sphinx 3.0 again with some sort of conventional cache, size, cache sizes um, done using um, 
uh, simple scalar and the like, um, compared with some spec mark um, uh, benchmarks, you know, GCC the compiler, GZIP the compression utility, and eQuake, which is a, a, a giant numerical um, earthquake, earthquake simulator. Um, and the yellow line here says what's going on in, the, um, in this particular um, run. Um, what, can, what can we say? Well, we can say a couple of things. Um, we can say that it's, you know, it's almost all loads. It's, it's not many stores. That's not a surprise. This is giant data structure that's being interrogated constantly to figure out what's going on. You spend vastly more time reading stuff than you do actually writing stuff. Okay? The second thing is that it has horrible locality. It's appalling locality. You know, 48 percent you know, L2, L2 miss rate. I've shown this, you know, this, this particular slide to some computer architects, and what they, what they uniformly tell me is, how can something that has a tiny footprint like 64 megabytes have an L2 hit, miss rate like an Oracle database? Right? And the answer is, it's a giant graph search problem. If I could actually get locality and know what I was looking up, I could recognize this stuff better. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay? I'm searching this humongous graph to try to bring the strands together to compute what the actual probability is that I recognize this. That's why this is so bad. Now, one of the other reasons why I'm showing this is that one of the pieces of feedback I usually get on this is, oh, you know, I can, I can watch a video on my cell phone. You know, I've got this video iPod. You know, there's these really sexy video DSP things. You know, why can't I just put this kind of application on that? And the big answer is that all the streaming media applications are profoundly local. Right? They are not hammering, or in this case, thrashing a 100 megabyte you know, data set with a 50% miss rate. You know, they are hammering a bag of a couple thousand constants for their you know, discrete cosine transforms on the side. It's a very different world. So what would an architecture for this look like? This is at the, the, literally this is the 50,000 foot view. It's a very, very high level view of this architecture. What would it look like? There would be a box that does, that does the acoustic front end. Okay? And what I need to tell you about each of these boxes is sort of how many ops are we doing, how much SRAM, how much DRAM, and how much DRAM bandwidth, because they're actually all different. So the acoustic front end um, computation, low. It's, it's not bad. SRAM size, small. It needs some constants, but it, but it doesn't hurt very much. DRAM, it doesn't need any. It just needs a little bit of constants. It's, it's not bad. DRAM bandwidth, no, no big deal. Gaussian scoring, very different. Computational rate, high. The highest thing inside the speech engine, actually. It's not the back end. The back end spends all of its time touching stuff. It doesn't actually compute that much stuff. The Gaussian scoring stuff spends a whole lot of time touching it and computing stuff with it. Okay? High computational rate, small SRAM size. You don't need a lot of on-chip storage for this stuff. Um, DRAM, medium large. Okay? DRAM bandwidth large. You are hammering that DRAM. You are pulling all of those, you know, all of those Gaussian computations out constantly for every sort of, you know, couple of milliseconds of speech. The back end, big DRAM, needs to store all of those, all of those language and um, word and uh, such models. Um, computational rate, medium. Not bad. It's mostly I.O. Right, it's not computational. Big SRAM. You need lots of storage on chip. The more you can get, the better you can do. Um, DRAM size, big. Right, to store the model, DRAM bandwidth, big, because you're hammering it. Right, so what are the essential implementation ideas for this stuff? Um, well, what I can say, what I would like to be able to tell you, okay, is that there's a couple of really sort of fabulous silver bullets. Um, unfortunately, that's not really the case. Uh, mostly this is sort of, you know, really aggressive, careful engineering, and like I said, a rather significant amount of sort of, you know, Diet Mountain Dew and pizza with a, with a high-performing speech recognition group. Right, so what can I tell you? It's custom precision anywhere. You know, the, the software versions of this are all, you know, IEEE doubles. There ain't no floating point in this stuff. It's all very aggressively optimized. Um, there's almost no caching. Um, like graphics chips, you fetch from the S from a synchronous DRAM and you do very, very careful data placement and you do as much overlap um, of the latency to hide the latency as possible. Now, if I said no caching, I'd be lying. There's a little bit of caching for bandwidth filtering, but this is a little bit. Um, aggressive pipeline, if we can possibly do some things at the same time, we do. That makes our life um, better. Um, and some algorithm transformation, because as soon as you actually try to find some concurrency in these apps, you get thwarted by the way the software versions of these things are run. So the algorithms as they stand don't actually work. You actually have to go in and sort of mess with them some, and then validate that you didn't mess it up. So um, this is a, a slightly busy diagram. I'm not going to explain it in, in any detail other than to say, you know, we have, we have pipelining action going on at the hidden Markov sort of, you know, Viterbi level. We have pipelining going on at the sort of the word level. We have pipeline going on at the sort of the, at, the, at the language model level. I mean, you actually have to try to look for as much parallelism as you possibly can up and down the food chain, um, the sort of the abstraction chain in these things, because you have so many active candidates 
right, for what you think you recognize next going on. You just can't sort of process them one at a time or even, you know, in a conventional CPU, you know, maybe eight at a time. And we actually have some algorithmic changes. I, I have one slide of, of trying to show that at a very kind of a high level. Um, software, the, the versions of software, um, you have a whole bunch of candidates and you're sort of computing some scores on, on, you know, on them. And you, you basically, you compute everything for all of the live candidates in the current frame um, after the Viterbi on the hidden Markov model. And then when you sort of compute all of the scores, you figure out what the pruning threshold is and you go back and you kill the guys below it. Um, that's great. The big problem is that then you can't actually start processing the next frame until you're completely done processing the previous frame, and that's a really bad idea. And so one of the things we do, you know, a simple trick, use the best score from the previous frame, okay, the previous 10 millisecond snippet of speech, and you assume that it's, you know, it's probably pretty close over a 10 millisecond um, um, duration. You know, that's a little bit of trade-off of accuracy, but that breaks a gigantic temporal bottleneck in the pipeline. That's just one example. There are lots of examples like this. So, what do you do? Well, if you're an ASIC kind of a person, you go off and you start writing simulators for this thing. And we've, we've developed lots and lots of different simulators for this. This is the most current one. This is a C++ cycle level simulator. The benchmark we're using is a standard benchmark. It's called the 5,000 word Wall Street Journal task. It's a medium, medium complexity, medium difficulty task in the speech recognition business. Um, I'm showing you a bunch of, of uh, results here. So Sphinx 3.3 is the fast version of the CMU recognizer. Um, slightly less accurate, but quicker. Um, Sphinx 4 is the very newest version of the recognizer running on both one and two CPUs. And Sphinx 3 is sort of the workhorse version of the recognizer. It's the most accurate. And we can say, you know, they're all sort of a similar accuracy, but, you know, around 7%. Um, three of them were run on a one gigahertz CPU. The sort of the best quality one was run on a 2.8 gigahertz CPU. Um, and then we have our, our, um, our cycle accurate um, um, simulator. And it's basically at the same level of, of recognition error. So, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, not falling off. Um, it's at a clock rate roughly 20 times slower, right, than the, than the Pentium here. And it's uh, heading toward 2x uh, real time, whereas the Pentium version is just barely managing 1 half x real time. Right, so it's just sort of an example of if you actually focus the architecture very carefully, you know, with a lot less silicon resource, with a lot less power, we hope, we're still working on that, um, you can actually get really good results. This thing needs about one and a half megabytes of SRAM and 30 meg of, um, of uh, DRAM and is, we think, well less than a million gates. Right, now just as an aside, you know, um, as soon as you start doing media, media kinds of data and uh, you actually have benchmarks like let's verify that this 40 minutes of human speech actually works on your cycle simulator, you suddenly start understanding why people love FPGAs. Okay, so you know you want to verify one of these things. These things run for days and days and days, right? And it's sort of awful. So we have a tremendous sympathy for people doing streaming media that we never had before. And this is just an example of the some of the sorts of sorts of trade-offs um, that we've that we've done. Now, um, simulators make ASIC guys happy. They make silicon guys happy. But it's sort of less than less less than exciting for for this kind of audience. So one of the things we've been working on for the last several months is a, is an FPGA version of this. And, you know, in, in any system design kind of context, there comes a point where you just want to see it run for real, okay, especially with a media-oriented kind of a design. So we, we mapped it to a Xilinx chip, um, actually a rather small Xilinx chip, a sort of a standard evaluation board. Um, and this is itself fairly challenging. This thing is using 99% of the slices, which is nuts. We have no reason on earth to, 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 to believe that this thing would route. It did. We use half of the block RAM. It needs 3 meg of uh, DDR DRAM. It runs at 50 megahertz, um, and it has 200 megabytes per megabits per second of I/O, and that's not quite enough to do the 5,000-word vocabulary. So we we down we sort of strip this back. This is a thousand-word um, military command and control task. It's a little simplified. It doesn't have the top level of the tri of the n-gram models. It's not real time. It's about 2x slower than real time. That's all basically based on the on the bandwidth limitation. It's, it's just basically a very small FPGA. Okay, so now we see if this thing actually works. Right here, see this is why we don't like software. Hi, my name is Edward Lin, and this is Kai Yu. We're here to introduce Carnegie Mellon University's In Silico Box project, a fully custom hardware speech recognition system running on an FPGA. Much like the software speech recognizer we reference, Carnegie Mellon University's Sync 3.0 are designed to handle continuous speaker-independent speech. For this demonstration, we've implemented the design on the Xilinx F2P development board of the Vertex 2 Pro XC2 VP30 FPGA. Due to limited board resources, we use a small 1,000-word vocabulary resource management task composed of military command and control phrases. 
To begin, we load static data from the compact flash to DRAM, which our recognizer accesses during decoding. We use the push buttons to start and stop recording. We use a microphone to take in speech input and a VGA monitor to display decoded speech, both of which are connected to the board. At no point during decoding do we use the PowerPC course located on the FPGA. Now we will demonstrate our recognizer in action. Again, recognition speed is limited by board resources. Draw Sacramento's last two locations in data window. Like I said, 2x slower than real time on this version. So, maybe not easy to read, but it said the right thing up there. Show me the Formosa Strait. Show the Formosa Strait. Now the question everyone wants to know. When is Windows available? As you can see, the speech matched the decoded text. This concludes our demonstration. So what it, what it lacks in technical values, we think it makes up in heart. Um, and, Kai and Kai and Edward are here if you want to go shake their hands. Um, you know, in the speech recognition community, this is still a pretty baby recognizer. Um, but you know, for a lot of people, this, you know, this is actually a pretty serious recognizer. And as far as we know, this is the most complicated recognizer architecture that's ever been completely rendered in hardware. This thing is you know, microphone in, flash compact card for the language model, you know, um, generates VGA directly out, all on the FPGA. So there's the when is Windows available line, sort of you know, photoshopped from the, from the video, just so you can you know, convince yourself that we really did that. Um, summary version of this whole, this whole line of work is that software is just too constraining to do speech recognition. It's much too important in application. The headroom is way too limiting to keep it in software. Just like the graphics guys did, it needs to get out of software. It needs to get in custom silicon. The Insilico Vox um, group at CMU has been working on architectures for this for the last couple of years. We have um, an ASIC version. We have almost, two th almost 2x real time for the 5,000 word um, version. There's a 10x recognizer in progress. We're very comfortable that we're going to be able to hit 10x, you know, then, then the goal is 100, then the goal is 1,000. We'll, we'll see how we do on that. The, FPA, the FPGA version is a very tiny design, little baby, you know, little itty bitty FPGA already working on the 1,000 on the, on the word vocabulary. Um, one of the things we're doing right now is um, if you were at Dave Patterson's ramp talk yesterday, we're actually using the B um, um, FPGA infrastructure from Berkeley. We actually got a couple of those things, and that's a, a giant amount of FPGA, so we're actually working on the 5,000 word vocabulary um, and then the 50,000 word vocabulary um, uh, on that right now. It's got 25x more FPGA resources. Sources, so we're actually very confident that we'll be able to pull that off. And there's um, another um, effort spinning up right now, which is trying to look at how we can maybe take these ideas and push them into the, the mobile sort of perform, um, uh, power limited space. Because so far, mostly what we've been looking at is the audio mining application. And with that, I hope your insulin levels have, have uh, not crashed to the point that you're, you're asleep. And uh, thank you. So happy to take questions. Yeah, quick question. Uh, could you say some words about uh, the parameters of what you're, you've done? Um, how much is relevant to English versus, say, other languages? Like, suppose you were doing Chinese, which, what would you be doing different? Um, so the, the question is, how much of this is English specific? Um, we've only run the English language models, but, but that's basically the, the architecture, you know, an acoustic front end that goes to a feature vector, um, a big scoring unit that maps um, features to, to probabilities and then all these layers of the back, that's standard. Um, there are in fact, there's, there's Spanish, there's Japanese, there's Chinese, um, English, uh, there's Chinese uh, Mandarin models in the, in the Sphinx universe. We haven't run any of those things yet, um, all, all doable. Pretty much when you see changes in the uh, language specific changes, you tend to see that in the acoustic front end. Right, so you know, English is not tonal. Chinese is tonal. You know, you need you need to track ups and up down ups or down up downs. I can never remember. Right, um, but no, it, it you know it, this this sort of architecture is 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 pretty generic. The the vision for this stuff obviously is that you know in, in something like a portable space, you walk up with your flashcard and you say, I'd I'd like to talk Mandarin now, and you pop it in and off you go. That's that's certainly the direction we want to go in. Mike Butts from Ambric, how much DRAM bandwidth uh, do you need when you say high bandwidth? How much is that? Well, right now, this thing, um, we need, you know, several hundred megabytes per second, right? So, I mean, this, this thing is sort of in the neighborhood. It's 200 and change right now, and that's not really enough for the hundred, for the, for the thousand word vocabulary. The other problem we have 
Um, so sort of think sort of graphic, think graphics chips. I mean, those, those guys are gigabit, you know, um, kinds of bandwidths. They have wider memories. We've only got a 32-bit wide memory here. They sometimes have multiple DRAMs, you know, with multiple ports. We don't. One of the problems we have right now, the acoustic front end doesn't, doesn't, doesn't need any DRAM stuff. That's all on chip. But the scoring thing is hammering the DRAM for its scoring stuff at the same time in the pipeline that the back end stuff is hammering for it. And right now, one of the problems is they're fighting for bandwidth. Right, so it, it's, it feels, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's well within the parameters of where, you know, the high-end, you know, DDR, you know, kinds of graphics, graphics, you know, chips are. I mean, we're, we're using a sort of a not very exciting synchronous DRAM, not very wide, one port, you know. I mean, we, we take a lot of inspiration from, from the graphics guys, or, you know, they're out in front of us. They need whatever they, whatever, we don't need that much bandwidth. <laughs> Although, you know, at 100x real time, at 1,000x real time, life gets interesting for us. But uh, so far, you know, we, we think we're well within the norm. Yes? I'm Bob Stewart. Uh, years ago, I had some of the early recognition hardware boards. And I'm curious, we had to train them. Uh, if you allow yourself the privilege of doing some training, how does that show up? in the model you presented earlier? Does it reduce the dimensionality of the problem? That's, that's an outstanding question. So the, the question is, what if, you're, what if you train? And, and that's such a wonderful, complex question because there's like a technology angle here and there's like a business model <laughs> angle here, right? So the sort of the, 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 the essential statement is, is you are what you train. The more you train, the better you can do, okay? But everybody hates to train. And in particular, everybody hates recognizers on their cell phones that they have to train. Right, so the question is, how much can you do without, without training? Right, that's, that's the first question. Now, when people train, basically in this particular model, when people train, what actually happens is that they take that, um, that big bag full of Gaussians that represents sort of the blob in feature space that is you know, a particular sound, and they do some sort of linear transform on it. Okay, so what you do is you'll, a bunch of words will pop up on the screen, you'll sort of talk to them, you'll know what the right answers are, you'll look at what the feature vectors were that were calculated, and you'll look at sort of where it landed you in the scoring, and you'll say, huh, is there some linear transformation of the feature space, all right, of that bag of Gaussians? Can I rotate it? Can I slide it? Can I stretch it? That gives me better probabilities for what I did. It doesn't reduce, right now, it does, no, it kind of makes things worse. <laughs> Right. Pretty much everything you do in speech recognition that makes the quality better makes everything for the hardware guy worse. Right. But right now, the sort of the most standard model is sort of a, there's another magic matrix after your feature vector that sort of takes your feature vector. I mean, if you, one, one way to think of it is that you sort of rotate the, that big space of scores. The other thing is that you take your feature vector and you sort of move it around in the space a little bit so that it sort of matches the stuff you've got trained a little bit better. That's one of the thousand ways people do this, but at the moment, that is the biggest way that people try to do the, try to do the training and try to, try to improve the quality. Great, uh, if there are no more questions, let's, uh, let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, um, our, our second talk is entitled A, a Novel Processor. Um, Architecture for High Performance Stream Processing, and it's being presented by uh, Jan, Jan van Lunteren. Um, he received um, the PhD degree in electrical engineering uh, from Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, and he's been working with the IBM Zurich uh, Research Laboratory in Switzerland since 1994, um, doing research in a bunch of areas, um, high-speed networking, um, high performance memory systems, uh, deep packet classification algorithms, um, and high performance uh, programmable accelerator engines. So please help me welcome Jan. Thank you very much. Okay, so, yeah, it works. So the title of my uh, presentation is a Novel Processor Architecture for High Performance Stream Processing. So what are we doing? So in Zurich, we have started some research project to investigate whether there are some opportunities for, say, a non-traditional processor. And the objective is basically to realize a kind of general purpose accelerator engine. And this in contrast to typical accelerators, which focus on one particular application. So we want to have something that's more uh, general purpose programmable. Uh, 
our initial focus is on applications that operate as we loosely define streams of data. And examples are XML or processing compression, uh, pattern matching, encryption, networking. And, and this list is not exhaustive. So basically what we try to uh, design is a single engine that is able to do each of those tasks and potentially combinations of them. We, we're basically, our solution looks like a, a kind of VLIW uh, style of processor, having obviously uh, multi, multiple uh, uh, functional units. But these units can be rather diverse, as we'll see in a minute. So we can have standard units such as ALUs, floating point, and so on. But it can also be much more complex. So we can have search engines in there. We can have all kinds of encoder engines. And basically, we can have small cores as well. So these units can have a rather large variety in execution time. And also the data that's being processed by each of the units can be highly variable. Now, our target is basically to run the processor at, at 2 gigahertz for CMOS uh, uh, or 65 nanometer CMOS. And we start with data processing rates of 10 gigabit. But the focus is, is, is way beyond this. So the key challenge is, is obviously how can you make something programmable and make it more general purpose, while at the same time being able to get good performance for each of the applications you want to support. Now, what we have done is following, and instead of developing a new kind of instruction set, and uh, with that special, say, execution units, which we partly have done as well, we have focused more on the way that instructions are being fetched and issued to those functional units. And the way we have done this allows us in a very flexible way to schedule our units to operate in various modes of, of parallel operation on the input data. And this is what we need in order to get to those high uh, data processing rates. Another related feature uh, that we built in is some powerful conditional branch capabilities. So, okay, so the concept of what we're doing at the kind of high level is, is shown in, these, in, in the following slide. And it is relatively simple. So, here we've got our functional units. Yeah? Some of them can be identical, they can be different. Typically, they're very diverse. Uh, these units can communicate directly with each other or via registers or some other form of local storage. They will operate on one or multiple input streams that, uh, can be, uh, that arrive over a separate input bus yeah, or are retrieved from memory. I mean, and an input stream, it can be some XML document. It can be some other stream where we want to do pattern matching, whatever uh, you, you want. So this part is how it exactly looks like is not relevant here. The focus of also this presentation will be on this block. It's a kind of centralized controller that will fetch the instructions from memory and issue them to those units. And it does so in the following way. So in each clock cycle, this unit will take a kind of a snapshot of the state of our processor. And with state, I mean the current value of what's, what's coming in over the input bus. And what is the status or what have been the processing results of selected or each of those functional units. And this is done in a single clock cycle at 2 gigahertz. And basically in response, it will analyze the situation yeah, and react with dispatching the appropriate instructions to handle what it just has seen, some events, for example, and send these instructions to selected or basically all functional units. So this is the concept. It's rather, rather simple to explain. But there, there are obviously two big challenges. How can you implement something like this to do this? In, 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 I mean, we dispatch the instructions within one cycle, basically. How can we do this at two gigahertz? And another yeah, equally important issue is how can you make something programmable in a flexible way? How can you use this so that some person or programmer who wants to implement a certain function on our processor uh, in, a, in a kind of efficient and, and, and effective means, uh, effective way, gets this uh, thing running on our processor? So the remaining of the uh, presentation will focus on this unit, and we'll I will try to uh, explain how we have addressed those challenges. So I'll start with what one could say, what's the traditional way of making something programmable? Uh, we get to this, say, the stored program computer uh, way back, 
which was developed by Van Neumann and others. And what this, in a sense, is you basically have a long list of instructions. You associate each of them with an address, and you walk through them by incrementing a program counter. Yeah? So we've got a, an instruction execution flow, which is kind of sequential. If you want to change this execution flow, you need to have explicit instructions, like a conditional branch. Yeah? And these have the characteristic that you're typically only able to look at one condition in parallel at a time, and these are relatively simple. So was my last result zero, was it greater than, and so on, things like this. Okay, modern processes are more advanced. With, with, uh, I mean, super scalar, you have multiple units, the, the dynamic scheduling, and so on. So, but this is kind of the bottom line. So if we would like to use something as this, to, to, to control our, our processor. We would, and, and we need to evaluate a lot of conditions in parallel related to the input stream and to our functional units. If we want to do this, we need many uh, instructions to implement evaluating those multiple conditions. So this takes tens of cycles or more, and this is not the response time we want. Another issue is we would like to have some more advanced uh, conditions, like for an XML acceleration application, if you have, have a parser implemented there that does some well foreigners check, like is this character allowed to be used in a name tag? If it's something very simple. But if you have Unicode, okay, you need, you need basically it's kind of a range uh, test. We would like to, to check this kind of uh, conditions in a single cycle. And we say Unicode, and we have a UTF-16 encoding, so 16 bits, then we need, we, we could you need a lot of cycles to implement this. So this won't work. So what we are doing, and this, this looks kind of abstract, but it's basically what we have implemented. Instead of associating instructions with addresses, we associate them directly with conditions. Yeah? You could compare this a little bit with a random access memory, and in this case, some kind of content addressable memory. Yeah, even a kind of ternary content addressable memory, where the easiest way to understand is a kind of ternary match factor. So we identify a group of instructions, yeah, and we evaluate in each cycle the conditions related to all those instructions. And basically, the instruction for which all those conditions match is being fetched and being dispatched to, to, uh, to the functional units. In case multiple match, we've got a priority scheme. So this is some kind of a branch instruction that allows to switch to different groups of instructions. So this is kind of abstract. An easier understanding and a, you could say embodiment of this concept, it's, it's narrower than what we do, but, but it's, it's for the sake of explaining it's, it's easier, is to see this as a kind of state machine that implements an enhanced kind of state transition diagram. And this is a very simple one. You could say, okay, this defines all my potential execution path in the program. Yeah? And now in each clock cycle, let's assume we're state zero, we evaluate all the conditions related to the transitions that originate in that state. We, we evaluate them in parallel, yeah? and the one that matches, we take that transition. And by this kind of real-time evaluation, we walk through the diagram. Very straightforward, but, but at, the, at the rate of one transition per clock cycle, at, uh, at multiple gigahertz. And all the instructions that we meet along our path are being dispatched to the functional units. Now, in practice, we have programs that consist of tens or hundreds of thousands of such uh, states. These conditions can, uh, using the example of a ternary match factor, can, for example, be 16 or 32 bit wide. And we want to run this at 2 gigahertz. So this is kind of a challenge. And we want to make this programmable as well, so update the diagram. So in order to make this feasible, we have developed a new type of programmable state machine technology in hardware, which Okay, it's beyond the scope and the time I have in this presentation to, uh, to go in all the details. So I won't bother you with all those details, but refer simply to a publication list in the backup material for, for those interested that can, uh, can look at some more of the details, how it actually works. J this is just a slide showing some of the, the uh, uh, giving give an indication of the flavor of what we're doing here. So if you have, a, and I illustrated using this example of a, conventional transition diagram. In this case, some pattern ABC is going to be detected, just for the sake of an example. So what we're doing is we describe this using so-called transition rules. And the difference with the state table is that we use wildcards and priorities. So rule three says, if I'm in state two with a C, I go to state three. 
It's a one-to-one, -one. that's simple. Rule one says, if my state is wildcard, so from any state, an input A will result in a transition to state one. Yeah? So that rule covers multiple, actually the red transitions in this diagram. And having this specification, you've created a hardware engine that evaluates all these rules in parallel in each cycle and determines, in a, like I said, in a fixed rate, so in one cycle, the highest priority rule for which all the conditions related to the actual values of state and input uh, values match. Now, this is a very short summary. Interesting aspect of this programmable uh, state machine is the following. Typically, programmable state machines in hardware are built by using state and in input factors as kind of index into a table, into some memory. Which means that you have an exponential relation between the width of your input and state factor and the size of the memory you need. With, we, we have played some tricks here, optimizations also of the state encoding, and we have been able to remove this exponential relation. And for, for example, for pattern matching and some other applications, we get a linear uh, relation there. So if we, we have 10 of such rules, we need, for example, 10 times 4 bytes or something like this, a storage. If we have 1,000, you need 1,004 bytes. It's, it's that, that uh, linear. Because of this linear relation, we're able to scale to extremely large diagrams. Hundreds of thousands is no problem. And at the same time, we are able to support wide in and output vectors. Yeah? Input, in, in the order of, say, 32-bit input, and we can generate 256 bits of, uh, of output. The critical path here is the dimension bit on the functions that we implement is about six or seven gates and one memory access. So we're, we're able to run this at two gigahertz without, uh, without a problem, we're approaching the edge, but it's, it's, it's certainly doable without too much effort. Last but not least, this also supports incremental updates, dynamic incremental updates. So if we would like to, we could even add states and transitions while this thing is running. Okay, so now, what we've done now, we have built our, uh, based our instruction fetch and issue unit on this state uh, machine. And what I forgot to mention before, actually, uh, the engine is based on an algorithm called BART, which is developed for routing table searches. The name is Balanced Routing Table Search, and hence we, we call it BART-based FSM, so BFSM. So this BFSM is basically the core block of our instruction fetch and issue unit. And these are implementation parameters. This BFSM is able to look in a single cycle in parallel at between 8 and 16 bits of, of the input value and between 16 and 32 bits of status or results from those functional units. In a single cycle, if you would like to inspect more, you just go to multi-cycle or to multiple state machines. But for our purposes, this was sufficient. And in response, is able to dispatch up to 256 bits of instruction factors to those units. This is a kind of transition rule, which is stored in some form in this memory, and which basically defines the, 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 the way to handle a certain situation. So it says, if I'm in a current state and my input value is search and search, and the following conditions apply, like this unit is still busy, that one has finished, that one has finished and has obtained some result. Yeah. Imagine this is a kind of ternary match factor. Then if all these things match, I move to a next state and dispatch the following instructions, which for example, are 256 bits in total. So in our case now, our executable becomes a long list of those rules. Yeah. And we, the hardware, from a conceptual point of view, is able to evaluate hundreds of transitions rule in parallel to pick out the one that we need to proceed with our processing. And what's now interesting, the things that you can do here is the following. So, Assume we have some functional units here which we want to synchronize. And this is kind of a piece of cake now, having this, uh, this kind of uh, construct available. So we just specify conditions like if this unit is done or has uh, reached the synchronization point, and the other one as well, okay, then we're in sync, and we dispatch some instructions to continue. You also will have one or two other rules saying, okay, if this unit has already reached the synchronization point and the other one not, we put the one that was already um, in front, we put on hold until the other one has also reached it. Yeah. And other, and that's, that's more the, the application that we're using it for, is that we are now 
able to set up units in a, in a, in a, dynamically in a, in a pipeline fashion. So if we, for example, in, in, in some form of processing, whether you do some protocol or, or compression or, or whatever, there are certain um, scenarios where you would like to put multiple in a, in a pipeline fashion. So basically, you set up rules covering all potential states of the pipeline you're interested in. And it's relatively simple. So if this would be a pipeline, you will have a rule that says, okay, if this unit as completed is processing, and this one as well, then the instructions determine, hey, we we'll move the result data to the next stage, and we initiate the processing of that data by this unit. Yeah. Another rule will say, okay, if this unit has completed its operation, and the next one has not, we simply have an instruction that says, okay, you have to stall this part of the pipeline or temporarily buffer the data. Of course, to implement this, you need a certain interconnect structure and, and some other stuff as well. But focusing only on the, uh, say, the way we dispatch the instructions, this is very simple. Okay, now, um, what I'm, so, so, okay, I have to rush a little bit then. So basically, uh, we can visualize our program again as a kind of state transition diagram. Yeah? We're a bit more flexible than this. You could also regard what we're doing as just we replace the program counter in a conventional processor by a state register, which is more or less the same, change the name, and we, we add next state logic. So we, we have made the way to determine the next value of the program counter a bit more flexible. We just replace it by a state machine. Which means also, if we don't specify any conditions, we just walk sequentially through our code. So we have the opportunity to implement the way we want this. One imp interesting implication is that all the other constructs of, a lot of the other mechanisms available in modern processors can, we can use as well. I mean, we, we, we simply load additional program data in here. Uh, we have a cache. We have, a, have procedure calls. Yeah? So we have a call stack here. Um, maar we can make a uh, procedure call to some, some code expressed in the same way and put the return state on the stack. Uh, another thing that we have implemented is an input classifier. So we can of course specify conditions like my input value is the following value, exact match for example. But you, you can also say, okay, if my input value is a digit or for XML parsing again, um, if it's a white space or if it's a, a character that's according to the spec allowed to be used in a tag name. All right, and there are more examples. So this information is, is classified here in a pipeline fashion. It's not in the critical cycle, but it's offered to the state machine and in a single cycle is able to evaluate this kind of complex conditions. So you could say what we're doing here as well is instead of having only a processor where we look at the instruction, we add a kind of to the instruction set, a kind of condition set as well. Okay, um, we also have an instruction cache which is optimized for this operation with the state machine. Remember, we, we, we're not associating instructions more anymore with addresses. So, and I, I don't think I have too much time left, so I go quickly over this one. Our state machine is a kind of hash function, a deterministic hash function. So on top of a cache, this would mean we calculate an index, uh, perform and, and memory address, then in the cache we compare this address with, with the tags that have been stored. If there's a hit, we provide data back, and at this level we again perform a, a comparison whether we have found the, the uh, hash table entry we want or not. What we've done, we, we've integrated uh, this functionality in our cache, and we still do both comparison, so the address and also the hash comparison, but we do this in parallel, and one is done in a speculative, uh, speculative uh, way and uh, basically if both will match we found our, our, our cache line or our hash table entry in, our, in this case our transition rule. So we, we have obtained a significant latency reduction and are now able to run this at, at, at the 2 gigahertz directly out of the cache. Another interesting uh, feature of this cache is now that we're able in a flexible way to map our transitions on cache lines. Now, if for some reason this would be our interesting execution path through, the, uh, through our uh, program, yeah? for example, this is time critical or this is the most frequently uh, used path, we can map, and in this example, we, we, we map four transitions on a single cache line. Uh, so we have here mapped 
these four and the next four uh, transitions on the on the, the next cache line in memory and so on. So if we fetch the first one, we get the, the three next probable cache uh, transitions, so our instructions basically, together in the same cache line. And hardware prefetch will also fetch the other one. So we can walk this path at the rate of one uh, transition per uh, clock cycle. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, so my experimental results. Okay, we have built several hardware prototypes, uh, also mainly also FPGA. We have done several simulations, also uh, built a range of simulation models for various applications. Uh, synthesis experiments have shown to run this really at 2 gigahertz uh, in 65 nanometer CMOS. We, we intend to try to optimize it beyond, but we have to see. And at that speed, we can obtain a maximum rate of one transition per clock cycle out of the transition rule cache. An interesting observation was, and thi this related to some hardwired accelerators that we had. And we wanted to make this uh, programmable. And it appeared that making it programmable using the state machine that we could uh, do with functional units that, that don't have to run for a long time on their own. They don't have to be intelligent because the central controller is able to dispatch new instructions in a short time. So we could substantially simplify them and then reuse them. And for several of these hardwired accelerators, we were able, in addition to make them programmable, even uh, increase the performance. Okay, th th these were kind of special cases. I guess this, this will certainly not hold in general, but the message is for, for the range of applications we are targeting, uh, making something like this programmable doesn't compromise too much on performance and, um, and say chip area, power efficiency, and, and all the other requirements we have. So to summarize, what I've shown you is some of the the concept behind the, uh, the processor we're currently working on. Of course, the focus has been on the instruction fetch and issue. Yeah? And as you see, I'm already uh, at the end of my time. So uh, in the near future, we we'll, we'll certainly uh, will uh, publish and also present work on how these functional units will look like for these various applications. And we're, we're still looking at whether we, we can come out with one single engine or perhaps two, but we have to see. And, and provide you with, with results on what kind of data throughput we'll achieve. And once more, basically the, and, and of course there have been a lot of non-traditional, say, pro processor ideas. So what we're doing is not revolutionary, and, and there are certainly overlaps, but um, our key differentiator and enabling technology is the state machine that's able to look at a lot of bits in parallel and dispatch a wide instruction uh, factor in return. And having this capability allows us now to put our functional units in various modes of parallel operation on the input stream. And, yeah, and the target is obviously to make something programmable and get good performance. And we're convinced that this, this is a very interesting approach to, to do this. Now, Last remark, okay, a considerable part is still in research phase. Of course, we're, we're already in, uh, evaluating uh, beyond what we can do with it. Uh, the, the, the applications which I'm, I, I can mention here are already listed. Uh, some enabling technology, the state machine was also used to uh, develop a pattern matching engine that was presented last year. Uh, and uh, this is some of the stuff we already have made available to customers as well. So, with this, I want to finish the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions or want to see some more details, um, I mean, some parts are still a bit abstract, I can assume. Uh, we, we, uh, we have prototypes there, and we, we certainly over time will be able to provide more details. So don't hesitate to, to, to contact me. And uh, yeah, with this, I'll, I want to finish the presentation. If you have any questions, go ahead. Thanks very much. I think we have time for a brief question. Nobody. Okay. So it was that clear or? or? <laughs> you can certainly contact you on if you have further questions. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 
uh, we come to the last talk in our session, um, and it's going to be describing a chip uh, application which is uh, a little bit outside uh, the scope of the previous talks here at, at Hot Chips. I think it's very interesting. Um, this micro manipulator array is going to be presented by um, Dr. Hideyuki uh, Funaki. Um, he received his doctorate from the Tokyo Institute of um, Technology in 1992. Um, he's currently a senior researcher at Toshiba's um, R&D center. And um, his main research interests are in uh, smart power devices and MEMS. So please help me welcome Dr. Fanaki. So, thank you for the chairman. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Hideki Funaki. Uh, first, I apologize for the absence of the first uh, author, Mr. Uh, Mr. Suzuki. He is unable to attend this conference because of the business problem. So, I'd like to talk about the fusion of nanobiotechnology uh, non and electronics on behalf of him. <coughs> Here is the outline of my presentation. First, I tell you the introduction of this, this research. Next, I explain the device structure and the the theory of physical interaction. Uh, then uh, I'll show you the experiment setup and result. Finally, I'll mention the future visions and conclude my talk. Now, I'd like to start with the motivation of our research. The fusion between medical science and engineering has offered a new value for our life. Recently, uh, the progress of nanotechnology has been remarkable. Especially, nanobiotechnology is a key technology in the wide field related to biology, such as medical treatment or diagnosis. On the other hand, we can learn various knowledge from biology, which is applicable to electronics in sensing or processing function. Even though the invention of a novel micromanipulator device for nanobiotechnology is the purpose of our research, the innovations of electronics by nanobiotechnology, such as self-repair devices, are our final goal. Next, I'll show you our approach to nanobioelectronics as an electronic company. In today's world, we have high demand for medical and health care. This leads to the promising future technology of tailor-made medical treatment corresponding to the need of the individual. Systems for diagnosis and treatment of diseases such as micrototal analysis system, DNA chips, and drug delivery system have been already developed. The fundamental principle of this system is based on chemical interactions. So we intend to use the physical interactions on the cellular level to create a new biological treatment system. As an example, we introduced a new concept of uh, physical antibiotics. I will explain the concept in the next slide. The field of ant antibiotics has been making remarkable pro progress through the years since the innovation of penicillin. However, there are remaining problems such as their harmful side effects and the multiple drug resistant bacteria, such as MRSA. The basic working principle of the conventional chemical antibiotics is based on obstructing the operation of the cell wall. This figure shows the action principle of physical antibiotics. The nanoparticle is injected into the cell by the physical interactions instead of chemical interactions. 
The cell wall is supported by high pressure of 8 pascal or 20 pascal. The cell is destroyed by injected nanoparticles under the high pressure. We consider that an injection model of nanoparticle into the cell wall had two processes. One is the adhesion process based on the thermal boundary layer theory around nanoparticles in the biofluid. Another is the capture process of nanoparticles to cell wall based on the equation of motion. The theory of the adhesion of nanoparticles is to explain the thermal distribution in the nanoparticle and the boundary layer. Here A is the radius of nanoparticle and B is the width of the stagnant layer in the biofluid. Under the boundary conditions, assuming the continuity of energy flow and the flow temperature of the biofluid, we can obtain the surface temperature of the nanoparticles T1A. The smaller the flow speed of the biofluid around the nanoparticle is, the larger the stagnant layer B is, then the higher the surface temperature of the nanoparticle is. This situation leads to the adhesion of nanoparticles to the biofilms or bacterial colony. In order to explain the capture of nanoparticles into the cell wall, we use the equation of motion for the mobile protein with the viscous damping constant in the plasma membrane Cx. If the complex amplitude of A and B are introduced, we obtain the equation five. Where omega is the angular, angular frequency of external mechanical vibration, and it is the defined the vibration efficiency as the ratio of the absolute value A over B. Then, considering Einstein relationship, Cx can be expressed using the diff uh, diffusion constant D. Under the condition that eta to minus two is sufficient rather than one, the equation can be modified as equation seven. This equation gives the optimal frequency omega for the efficient vibration and is very useful for designing in vivo and in vitro applications. For feasibility study of uh, physical antibiotics, we introduce a new MEMS-based reactor to observe interaction between cells and nanoparticles. In order to obtain large collision energy between cells and nanoparticles, we adopted the vibration of mechanical diaphragm by electrostatic force. The diaphragm is fabricated on SOI and its size is four millimeters square. The cavity formed the small gap between the diaphragm and the silicon substrate. As I mentioned earlier, we introduced an electrostatic driving method. However, an electrostatic drive under the wet environment can short out the electrodes of the electrostatic actuator. We avoided this problem by applying a hydrophobic coating to the diaphragm. A hydrophobic coating is generated with a mixed gas, gas of chlorinate, silicon, and water vapor. This figure shows the block diagram of experimental setup. A water droplet of yeast cell and silica particles was applied directly on the diaphragm. Yeast cells are chosen for testing material since they have typical characteristics of biocells.
the fabrication process of the reaction reactor is follows. First, the main device structures are fabricated on SI wafer by 0.25 micrometer standard CMOS process. Second, the oxide layer is etched down to the silicon substrate by reactive ion etching and formed lattice is arranged in a 30 mic uh, micrometer pitch. Then cavity is formed by isotropic etching the silicon substrate using xenon difluoride gas. Finally, hydrophobic coating is deposited using fluorinate chiran and water vapor gases. Here the experiment, experimental result of the mechanical diaphragm excitation are described. The left image shows the optical, re, optical and laser microphotograph of the liquid mixture of the yeast cell and sick particles before excitation. The yeast cell and particles are separated from each other at first. The right images show the photomicrograph after electrostatically driving the me mechanical diaphragm at 30 volt and 1 kilohertz frequency. The results from analyzing cross-section of laser microscopy is shown in the uh, right side of this slide. And this, this is uh, cytoplasm and this is uh, cell wall area and this is a part particle. Although the silica particle was not completely absorbed by the yeast cell, it can be uh, observed that after mechanical vib vibration, the silica particle is within the yeast cell wall. This image shows the ab absorption of particle group to the yeast cell. Taking advantage of thermal boundary layer theory, we can improve the adhesion of the particle to the yeast cell. In this experiment, we succeeded in showing adsorption of the particle to the cell, which has first stage of the physical antibiotics phenomenon. However, the additional physical energy is required for the complete destruction and destruction of the cell wall. So, we have investigated another ex external excitation energy. As another physical energy, we introduced the electrical heating based on the Joule effect using the same device as the previous experiment. The mechanical diagram consists of micro dish array and the size is 30 micrometer square. Each micro dish contains 12 series diode to generate joule heat. The diodes are connected to the lattice with spiral arm which supply bias current and insulate heat each other. The left figure shows the current voltage character characteristic of the integrated 12 3 diode into a micro dish. Joule heat is generated with a large forward current. The heat contactance is ob obtained to microwatt per Kelvin from the measurement. And the summer capacity of micro dish is 3 nanojoule per Kelvin. Based on this result, the right figure shows the relation, relationship between the temperature increase of micro dish and what current. This figure shows the time dependent characteristic in the diode, diode heating experiment. The dish temperature rises quickly with the current. 
because the thermal capacity of the dish is small, the temperature of micro dish achieve equilibrium in a few milliseconds, and the response time is very short. Here, the outline of heating experiment is described. A load transistor is connected to the diode array in micro dish to generate and regulate heat. This load transistor works as a current source and the current through the forward bias diode can be adjusted by changing the gate bias voltage of this transistor. To detect the temperature of the dish area, an infra infrared camera is used. The temperature resolution of the infrared camera is about 10, at 0 0.2 degrees Celsius. In order to measure the absolute temperature, a black body furnace was used. This figure shows the temperature of the chip according to changing the gate voltage of the load transistor. The current that flowed to the 12 series diode for single dish is uh, 200 nanoamperes at the bias voltage of 1.5 volts and 700 nanoamperes at 2.0 volts respectively. This figure shows the temperature shift at the gate bias of 1.5 and 2.0 volts. The shift in heat is about 9.7 degrees Celsius for the gate bias of 2.0 volts. Next, I'd like to describe the uh, selection heating mode experiment. The aluminum uh, layer are wired to the four area of mechanical diaphragm. The DC power supply voltage was applied to each micro dish by shift resistor line by line. The sweep speed of applied voltage can be changed by changing the clock frequency. The current flow only the select diode because of the rectification property of the diode. The current of diode can be also controlled by the gate voltage of the load transistor. The images show the temperature distributions of local heating uh, when the width of one pass is assumed to be uh, 100 microsecond. The high temperature area shift the position from the right to the left side of figure with time. Because the shift register sequence and surprise bias current from the right to the left dish. The temperature of the micro dish attained 62.6 degrees Celsius. To demonstrate the lower and higher switching operation, we tried various driving frequency. I'd like to show you the video movie for the each frequency operation. This is the uh, pass one, one second. And this is uh, 100 mesic. This is 10 milliseconds. 
This is a one millisecond, and the intensity is very weak because of very uh, high speed. This figure shows the compression of heating and ability put portion and the four micro dish. We obtained more than tw um, twice heat efficiency of arbitrary portion heating. This e effect provides a novel manipulator structure which can apply a very short heat pass locally. This is a remarks of uh, micro dish heating. Heating of whole micro dish array and just an arbitrary portion of micro dish was demonstrated. Rapid temperature switching on nano, uh, microsecond order was confirmed. More than twice the uh, heat effect was achieved in heating an arbi uh, arbitrary portion compared with heating the whole micro dish. We also propose the advanced device operation based on this manipulator. A portion of the micro, uh, micro dish array is used to, as a thermal sensor. While the uh, three diode heat micro dish, the temperature rise of the micro dish also shifts the um, bias voltage of the diode because of temperature dependence of the diode. We can sense a small shift of this uh, bias voltage by amplifying the signal electrically. Then the temperature difference between target cell and blank can be uh, detected. The other uh, micro dish is used as a reference to cancel the silicon substrate effect. Since the dish has no cavity on the substrate, we are now preparing for the measurement of the temperature spikes caused by exothermic biological reactions. Finally, I'd like to mention the future visions concerning the reaction, uh, reactor device that we examined. We focus on harmful bacteria living inside the human body. Once the bacteria is specified, sim uh, sample issue is removed from the body, and the best destruction condition of the target cell are determined with the MEMS reactor. After the nanoparticle is dosed, the reactor is applied to the treatment of disease using optimized parameters. In order to avoid side effects and reduce the time, nanoparticles remain in the body. Thus, the choice of safe and effective nanoparticle material is very important. Such visions can be attained by knowledge collaborations across um, various research fields of physics, material science, biology, and pharmacy. So I'd like to conclude my talk. We have developed a nanoparticle manipulator using a novel MEMS based structure. We also demonstrate direct physical control of the interaction between each cell and silica particles in liquid for the first time. The adsorption of the particle to the cell was demonstrated using vibrational energy and dual heating energy according to the external uh, excitation. These results show a potential impact in medical fields such as physical antibiotics and cell treatment and next generation bioelectronics schemes. Thank you for your kind attention.
few minutes for some questions. Okay. Actually, I, I have a quick question. Um, I, I noticed uh, when you were uh, scanning your array uh, with the thermal heating of the different cells, you got very good thermal isolation between the different wells. Yeah. You could. Uh, uh, And this spiral arm um, ensures the diode to the um, frame. Okay. Okay. Another question? Uh, yes, you showed the particle uh, entering a uh, yeast uh, cell. Um, I wasn't very clear on sort of what the uh, categories of cells that you want to eventually apply this technique to. I'm sorry? What sort of cells? Uh, just uh, viruses, uh, parts of the human body? Is there any particular restriction? What other cells besides yeast cells can you use this technology for? Yeah. Yeah. So what? Like, uh, what other cells besides yeast cells? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Ah. Uh. This cell is about 5 micron um, radius and uh, um, thicker particle and less than 1 micron size. Okay, so you're focusing on cells that have a very thin uh, membrane, hydrophilic, hydrophilic uh, that is around 5 microns in size. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of uh, session number seven. Um, I guess we have a, a break right now, and then we'll be starting uh, session eight on communications. Thank you very much. Thank you.